So hello, I'm Dr. Lorelei Corcoran, Professor and Director of the Institute of Egyptian Art and Archaeology at the University of Memphis. Uh, welcome to the 16th annual William J. Murnane Memorial Lecture. This is sponsored by the Institute of Egyptian Art and Archaeology and the Department of History at the University of Memphis. This lecture is one in a series that commemorates the life and work of our late colleague, Bill Murnane, professor of history at the University of Memphis and renowned for his contributions to the history of ancient Egypt, especially the Amarna period. Our series highlights the work of scholars whose research complements that of Dr. Murnane's. And this year we focus on a unique aspect of Bill's life and work on a subject that combines two of Bill's great passions ancient Egypt and opera. Who could, after all, forget that Halloween at Chicago House in Luxor, Egypt, when Bill dressed as a Wagnerian Valkyrie with pots and pans from the kitchen as a breastplate and armor. In honor of Bill's very real love of music and especially of opera, Indeed, Bill's recording collection rivaled his library of Egyptology books. It is fitting, therefore, that this year we share with you the research of another Egyptologist who is better known for his contributions towards the history and art of Ptolemaic and Roman Egypt, but who has recently become intrigued by ancient Egypt's influence on modern American theater, ballet, and opera, especially on the work of five-time Tony Award winner and two-time Academy Award winning choreographer, Jerome Robbins. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Stanwyck. Dr. Stanwyck received his BA Phi Beta Kappa from Haverford College with a major in classical and Near Eastern archeology span at Bryn Mawr College and his PhD in Egyptian and Roman art and archeology span at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, at New York University. Dr. Stanwyck serves on the board of the American Research Center in Egypt and as a reviewer for the Journal of Ancient Egyptian Interconnections, JARSI, AJA, and Cambridge University Press. Among his many insightful publications, identifying multicultural influences in the art of Ptolemaic and Roman Egypt is his monograph, Portraits of the Ptolemies, Greek Kings as Egyptian Pharaohs. Please enjoy this very special lecture by Dr. Paul Stanwyck, Jerome Robbins, and Akhenaten, an acclaimed choreographer's encounters with ancient Egypt. Thank you, Lorelei, for that wonderful and warm introduction. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak as part of this series. And I wish I could have been there in Memphis, would have loved to I've never been to Memphis, but would have loved to have visited. But it's also just in a way equally as good to be there remotely and more people could attend in, in that way. So let's get going. Uh, we're gonna talk about a number of things uh, during this talk. One is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about who Jerome Robbins was, especially for any of you who may not be that familiar with him. And then I'm gonna talk about how he became interested in ancient Egypt and specifically in the Pharaoh Akhenaten. And then I will talk about how Egypt was reflected in his work. And, and in particular, we'll be looking at one ballet called Glass Pieces from 1983. So Robbins was a, a major Broadway show director and ballet choreographer. He was based in New York City. He won a lot of awards. And importantly, uh, even though he passed away you know, over 20 years ago, his works continue to be performed and appreciated today. And a couple of things that really made him successful was the fact that he had this really exceptional ability to, to entertain and engage his audiences. And then he also engaged deeply into the subjects that he was exploring. And in this case, in looking at Egypt, I mean, he, he did a deep exploration of, of ancient Egypt. He was a prolific diarist. So here we have a picture from a 1977 uh, diary and of course records things uh, about his life. Um, they're very graphic, as you can see there. And the 
you see that there is that mask of 210 common in this 77 diary, and it probably reflects the fact of his awareness of the treasures of 210 common exhibition that was traveling in the United States at that point. And that was the first major blockbuster uh, exhibition. Okay, and then his mid-career, uh, he had uh, major success on Broadway and Hollywood, an important work from that period. He co-directed the West Side Story movie in 1961. And if you're aware, this movie actually has now been remade by Steven Spielberg and I think will be coming out uh, this holiday season. And then in his late career, he was uh, focused on creating uh, works for the New York City Ballet. And as I mentioned, we're gonna look specifically at this uh, last pieces ballet from 1983. Also during that late period, he worked with uh, the composer Philip Glass on the Akhenaten opera. And the story of this opera is how this pharaoh introduced this radical new religion that really disrupted um, uh, you know, traditional religious thinking in Egypt. There was a whole team on this. And one of them was this, an Egypt scholar by the name of uh, Shalom Goldman, who was an NYU graduate student. We're gonna talk about him a little bit more later. Unfortunately, uh, Robbins had to drop out of the project in 1983 after the death of uh, George Balanchine and the project continued without him. Nevertheless, he did take ideas that he was exploring uh, in, in preparation for that opera and ideas from Egypt and incorporated them into this ballet from 1983 that was called uh, Glass Pieces. He had a long term interest in Egypt. It seemed to have started way back when he was a toddler, when his uh, nanny would take him to play near Cleopatra's Needle in New York. And this is the ancient obelisk in Central Park. And then later, in the period that we're talking about, he did see that Tutankhamen exhibition in New York City. He um, had a private viewing of the Temple of Dender at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that opened during this period. He collected books on Egypt and he uh, took a trip to Egypt in 1981. Egypt and Robbins was, was really closely integrated with his Judaism. And he had this lifelong interest in trying to understand the roots of his uh, Jewish faith. And so his encounter with Egypt was based in uh, the view of Egypt from the Bible, the sort of imagined and mythic Egypt that you see in the book of the Exodus. And he visited both Israel and Egypt. Egypt was also part of his social circle. He had this long friendship with his poet, Robert Graves, who wrote these poetic studies of ancient myths, including you know, exploring the symbolism of stories and objects from Egypt. Um, and as you can see from that uh, quote below, Robbins felt that he owed this you know, major debt of, of gratitude for the ideas and inspirations that uh, Graves gave him. Now, why was he specifically interested in Akhenaten? Uh, so that quote from Philip Glass says, you know, Jerry knew quite a bit or quite a lot about Akhenaten, meaning that prior to his involvement in the opera about Akhenaten, he had already been exploring, apparently been exploring uh, ideas about that particular pharaoh. And there are a number of re probable reasons for that. One is perhaps Robert Graves, you know, got him intrigued by Akhenaten because Graves wrote about him. There was also this whole idea of how the monotheism that Akhenaten created was, was related to Judaic monotheism. And there are also all these other famous writers and thinkers who were, you know, talked about Akhenaten, like Sigmund Freud and Thomas Mann, Agatha Christie, and in fact, Freud had suggested that Akhenaten was the, the Egyptian king of the Exodus in the Bible. Egypt was connected strongly with 20th, 20th century dance in the US in general. It, it was really, it fascinated many choreographers. They were looking at the origins of dance. They saw authenticity in ancient dance. They got inspired by it. And there's that quote from Martha Graham, uh, writing to Robbins, which says that, uh, uh, as with her, he was like, likewise inspired by the past to, uh, to bring things into his contemporary work. Egypt was connected to ballet. He, Robbins had this a long relationship with uh, Lincoln Kirstein, who was a co-founder of the New York City Ballet. 
And interestingly, Kirstein actually traced the roots of ballet back to ancient Egypt in his 1935 book on dance. He is depicted in this statue, a uh, man walking from 1933, which uh, interestingly is uh, inspired by this Egyptian statue, gold statue in the Metropolitan Museum of Art that Kirstein admired. The Egyptian canon also can be seen as having a relationship to ballet. So for example, both have this emphasis on youthful athleticism, both have this very codified canon of poses that are possible. Both have the interaction of male female pairs. And importantly, there is this focus on profile views that you see in Egyptian art that also occurs in, in ballet with this emphasis on the turnout and showing the leg and the foot and, and profile. In 1981 trip to Egypt, he, he kept the diary. And importantly, I'm gonna note, this was prior to his involvement in the Akhenaten opera that he had taken the trip. And you see him here at Abu Simbel in Egypt with his partner at the time, Jesse Gerstein. Gerstein may have been part of um, the impetus that got Robbins to Egypt because Gerstein had previously visited Egypt and maybe encouraged Robbins to take the trip. It was a 10 day tour and, and it was a guided tour. So, so they were brought to many sites and places, museums, et cetera, car, car, plane and boat all over the country. In his diary, Robbins recorded a number of things. Importantly, he recorded um, a lot about movement. For example, uh, the, the moped, the donkeys in Cairo. And he had this extended description of this group of school children that he encountered and how they moved around and the sounds that they made. He also recorded things about antiquity and, and about having seen these, these various temples at Esna Edfu, Gender and Abydos, and that caused him to imagine like what was it like to live in those times and what were the ceremonies, et cetera. He recorded objects that he saw in the Cairo Museum, as we see in this one example here of a sketch of a statue of a king and a white crown on that page of the diary. Um, and this is actually a parcel sketch of this statue where uh, it's the upper part of the king and it's his right hand holding the left hand of that goddess who is interestingly the ancient goddess of dance. So this immediately raises the question, unfortunately unanswered in the diary, did he really know that this was the goddess of dance that, that was in this uh, statue? Because it's a, was he thinking maybe about a, physically about a partnering move because uh, a large part or you know, a good part of what happens in the dance are, are partnering moves where people hold hands or otherwise um, use each other's weight to, to execute certain maneuvers. So was that part of why he was sketching this or was this kind of more of a metaphorical partnering that he was thinking about with this ancient goddess of dance? He uh, saw this Roman mummy portrait, which he thought looked a great deal like him himself. And you can see, you know, there's a very strong resemblance between that portrait and himself. So he was kind of envisioning himself as being part of that ancient Egyptian culture in a way. Looking in more detail at the objects that he was examining, importantly, he, he does not explain why um, he chose to illustrate certain objects in the diary, but I, I'm gonna make some guesses based on <clears throat> having done a lot of research on him uh, and figuring out like what might he have been thinking about. So perhaps he was thinking about ideas for a movement to pose vocabulary. Maybe he was thinking about characters in a story ballet. Uh, maybe he was thinking about a set design. So if you're gonna set a ballet in ancient Egypt, what kinds of things might be on the stage or Maybe he had some kind of personal aesthetic attraction as we saw with that uh, mummy portrait earlier. He took particular interest in this one statue, it's a wooden statue, a figure in a white crown and he sketched it three times. And we see those sketches here. And one of the sketches, the figure 
is on a grid and the arm is moving and the staff is missing. Uh, in another version, unfortunately, I don't have the full page. You can just see the feet there, but it's again that figure with the, the legs further apart. And then the third version, uh, the figure is colored in gold and the costume and the posture have been altered. So why were there these three versions? Was he imagining movements based on the statues? So in other words, like before you got into this pose, what, what were you doing? And then after you were in this pose, what were you doing? So this, this pose the statue makes is an interim pose for some longer movement. Maybe he was trying to study and absorb the Egyptian style. After all, this, this pose the statue takes is something that is a highly characteristic pose that you see in Egyptian material. And if you draw something, you experience it and absorb it in a way different than if you're just kind of looking at or even writing about it. the act of drawing pulls you into an object in a way that other ways do not. Why did he create this grid? And I, I have a, a comparison here to an actual ancient Egyptian grid of which there are many examples. Was he studying or did he you know, have some awareness of the ancient Egy Egyptian grid system? Was he, I don't know, thinking about proportions? Was he thinking maybe that movement could be defined or regulated by that, that grid somehow. And he does seem to have had knowledge uh, of the ancient Egyptian grid system, because as you see, the lines are not exactly, but they're pretty close to where one would expect them to be in an ancient Egyptian grid. Let's look at that opera. And here's the chronology of the Akhenaten opera. It starts in 1979 when, uh, Philip Glass gets inspired by this book by Velikovsky to compose the opera. It would be the third of a, a trilogy he created about famous men, the other two being Einstein and Gandhi. In 1981, the Brooklyn Academy of Music president suggested to Robbins that he direct the opera. And Robbins you know, was interested and then started uh, in 1982 throughout the year to meet with uh, Philip Glass and a whole team. Uh, to conceptualize the opera. Early the following year, Robbins drops out and then the project continues without him. And then it eventually premieres in Stuttgart in March of 1984. This is an opera that continues to be performed today. And in fact, the Metropolitan Opera in New York did a production now, it's like a, maybe a couple of years ago. So what were they doing during these meetings that they were trying to, for that whole year, basically, that they were uh, trying to think about this opera? Um, so there were very social meetings in Robin's townhouse. Uh, you know, there was food and art and books and, and drink, et cetera. And as you see from that map, the townhouse was really a stone's throw from the couple of blocks, basically from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And indeed the group uh, made at least one visit to the Egyptian uh, collection to look at material there. We have evidence, you know, the recorded evidence of what they talked about in some of these meetings. Uh, so as examples, we were talking about Egyptian scribes. They were talking about the use of color uh, in ancient Egypt. They were talking about Akhenaten city of Amarna. And interestingly uh, for us, they were also talking about movement that they could perceive and art from the time of Akhenaten. And as a result of this, the libretto for the opera got revised and the production was planned. Now, for Robbins, what he would have been thinking about during this whole period was, what is this opera gonna look like? So this is like three hours uh, with this music and singing. And what is, what's gonna be the set? What, what's gonna be the whole appearance of this? And importantly, the movement that was gonna accompany all of the singing, singing and, the, and the action going on in the stage. That would have been occupying a lot of his thinking processes. Uh, Sean Goldman, so this is the American University graduate student. He was responsible for scholarly research that he brought to the group. He completed his PhD in Hebrew and Biblical Studies in 1986. Interestingly, his focus on Egypt, like Robbins, was coming from the viewpoint of the Bible. Goldman uh, photocopied books. He, he 
showed lots of slides of Amarna, Akhenaten material that he took uh, from visits to Egypt and, and museums. Golden was responsible for the selection of ancient texts that ended up in the opera uh, at the urging of Philip Glass because Glass thought that these texts could add a kind of authenticity uh, to the opera. And pictured there is the, you know, the bibliography from the first published version of the libretto for the opera. I'm going to point out here, this is really important to think about. So this is the early 80s. So the internet, as we know it today, did not exist. You could not do that Google search I just showed. There was nothing like that. So this group, they were looking at books. They were going to museums. And they were visiting Egypt. That's how they were understanding Akhenaten. There were also were not that many books available at that time compared to what we have today. One of the important series is this Rock Tombs of Alamorna uh, by Norman Degar Davies, which has lots and lots of illustration lines drawn in them. And then there were a couple of exhibition catalogs, one of which Robbins owned, uh, Nefertete and Akhenaten, which was uh, from an exhibition in Berlin in 1976. So what happens during this opera? It starts with the funeral of Amenhotep III, who's the predecessor of Akhenaten. And then we have the coronation of Akhenaten. Then we have the attack on the Amun temple. So this has to do with the whole idea that he, Akhenaten, unleashed this whole religious revolution. So they were attacking uh, the ancient religion, the prior religion. There's a love duet between him and his spouse, Nefertiti who kind of explored their, their relationship. There's a dance for the new capital city. This apparently, according to Golden, was added specifically because of Robin's involvement. There's a hymn to Aten, which you, this is what the scene that you see uh, uh, in that photo there. And then finally, there's uh, the destruction of the, the capital city. So in other words, after the death of Amarna, there was a reversion back to the old religion and his memory was wiped out. And the last tableau in the opera are tourists on the modern ruined sites of uh, Akhenaten city. In terms of the cast, there was a scribe narrator, the royal family, priests, uh, and the Egyptian people. Last piece is ballet. So here's a chronology. So while they were working on that Akhenaten opera, Robbins got very intrigued by Glass's music and said, hey, I'd like to use some of it to, to create a new ballet. Glass agreed. And then in uh, November of that year, uh, Robbins started to rehearse uh, Glass pieces. Following February, he, he drops out of the opera project, but continues with the ballet, which then premieres in uh, May of that year. And then uh, about a year later, the Akhenaten opera comes out in streetcar. The last piece this is not a narrative ballet. It is, it's, in other words, it's not a story. And it is a, a, a well-known Robbins work that continues to be performed to the present day. And in fact, in the most recent fall season of the New York City Ballet, they, they revived this ballet. One of the famous poses in it is the so-called Egyptian pose from the second section from the couple and you can see why they, it's called that because you've got that head in profile, you've got the front shoulders, striding legs, uh, and the, the staggered figures in, in a way similar that you see in Egyptian art. Now it's not exact, for example, the arms are of the couple, the, the, two, uh, the man and the woman are, are not you know, Egyptian. So there's some adaptation and rethinking going on. It's not an exact, is a copy of what you see in Egyptian material. Now to go through this ballet, I'm, I, I'm looking at it as a process and I came up with this based on the work of this Harvard Business School professor. And now she created it for the creative process in business and I've, I've adapted it for uh, what happens in cho uh, the choreographic process. So the first step, you're, you know, you're conceptualizing you know, the ballet. And as Robin said, well, I thought I'd get my feet wet and do a ballet before I did the opera. So he's connecting his work uh, on the ballet with what he was doing uh, uh, on the opera. And he you know, obviously loved lots of music. So he chose uh, the music. Two of the pieces come from this 1982 album. And then the third piece comes from the yet to be premiered uh, opera is a piece called The Funeral of Amenhotep III. 
Uh, third step is you choreograph it with dancers and collaborators. Robbins chose to work with Fran Leibowitz. Now, Fran Leibowitz was neither a dancer nor a choreographer. I would call her more of a cultural critic. So that the idea was, I think, that she would be like the super audience person who could react to things that he was developing uh, you know, for this ballet. And as she stated uh, later, first thing I, I felt uh, was shocked. You mean you make with the people there? I thought there was some sort of system like notation or hieroglyphics. What she's saying here is that what she thought would happen would be that Robbins would somehow conceive in his head or on paper what this ballet was going to be, what it's going to look like, you know, the steps and sequence and all these kinds of things. But that was not, in fact, how he worked. And as he states here, I know none of the steps before I begin. I have to work out that out in the studio with the dancers. In this case, that's of particular interest because one of the people he was working on the ballet with was. Uh, the dancer Bart Cook, who has a lifetime interest in ancient Egypt. And in fact, uh, Cook and Heather Watts accompanied Robbins uh, on that uh, private visit to the Temple of Dender at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he and his partner, Maria Caligari, you know, they worked with Robbins on creating that Egyptian pose. There are three sections to this ballet, one for each of the fours. In the first section, we've got dancers across the stage, this untempo music, uh, and the arrival of these figures that are called angels. We'll talk more about them later. In the second section, there's this duet with a line of dancers in the back uh, with down tempo music. Uh, in the third section, uh, there are these ceremonial patterns uh, with this, you know, circles and lines, etc. And then with this ecstatic crescendo that you see pictured there. Um, and then the fourth step you present to the audience. So it premiered in 83 and you see uh, Cook, Robbins and Caligari taking a curtain call. And then finally, you have the audience responses and critical commentary. And that for this ballet that begins in 1983 with this review in the New York Times and has continued to the present day as the ballet has continued to be performed. And what these reviews generally say is that it is, the ballet is a commentary on modern urban life. And we'll see why uh, a little bit later on. And they relate it stylistically to the work of the, these choreographers who are called postmodernists, like Lucinda Childs. Um, and Egypt is occasionally mentioned in these uh, reviews, uh, mainly because of the Akhenaten opera music or that Egyptian pose that we saw earlier. And, and interestingly, the latest review of the ballet based on the, uh, the fall season performance of the New York City Ballet continues with this modern urban life idea to, and says that the three sections of the ballet can actually be compared to the three phases that New York City went through in the COVID uh, pandemic. So it starts pre-pandemic New York pandemic New York, and then the third section is New York coming out of the pandemic. So it's interesting that the, this has been, you know, repeated and repeated and repeated about this, how people talk about it being as a commentary on modern urban life. And in fact, if you did a comparison from that first section, just look at pedestrians, you can see why so many people have that kind of reaction. And they even say things like, well, that grid at the back, that's actually a subway tile, which is again, kind of another urban uh, motif. The other thing that they say about it is that it's related to these postmodernists like Lucy the Childs, this whole idea of pedestrian choreography, which means taking like everyday types of movements and bringing them into, into dance. And for ballet, that would have been quite a contrast because ballet has all these very formal kinds of gestures, poses, et cetera, and putting something pedestrian in would, would create quite a, quite a contrast. Now, interestingly, that example of uh, the walking with some of the childs was actually on a grid from the 1973 piece. And as she uh, explained later, that grid had a way of regulating and orienting her dancers during, during that piece. The other part of the narrative is that that grid backdrop that you've been seeing is actually graph paper. In other words, it's not the Egyptian grid. It's, it's, and the reason for that, and this is documented, is that Robin used graph paper to chart the structure of the glass score. So he listened to the score many, many times, and he was trying to 
figure out the structure of it so you could then figure out how to create movement in relationship to the score. And he was using graph paper to do that. Also, Bart Cook used graph paper to help those dancers at the back do their steps correctly. If you were to see the ballet, it kind of looks sort of simple what they're doing, but it, it's actually very complex to perform accurately. And the dancers have difficulty learning it. And he had a way of depicting it on graph paper that helped them understand it and get it. So Egypt is mostly absent from this narrative um, that you know, we read about. Now, Robbins commented that he wasn't really trying to do a portrait of the big city in that piece. So the question is, what was he trying to do? And, but he does say that he is intrigued when people come up with interpretations and he's very open with that because there are things that happen consciously and subconsciously that he's bringing into the work and maybe things that he hadn't even thought about that people see that he welcomes all of those different types of uh, perspectives that people bring to watching his work. So as Egyptologists, can we see more of Egypt in glass pieces than that narrative we've seen so far has said? So one of the ways we could look at this is to look at the music itself. Uh, and as he commented, Robin's comment, it was, you know, the ballet had this whole ritualistic sense because of the highly repetitive and pattern nature of that score, which I hope you kind of heard in that, that video excerpt. And you could say, hey, well, that's, that's what Egyptian material is. It's, it's got all this ritual depictions in it and it's very repetitive in pattern. So there's kind of an underlying relationship there between the music and the way Egyptian art is. And you could you know, look at that phrase and then compare it to that line of dancers at the back in the second section. And if we look at that, um, that thing he did on the grid and then compare it to the figure in glass pieces, you see you know, there are some fair number of similarities. The, the grid backdrop is a similar proportion and the figures are in profile. They have that short skirt and an arm out and they have this kind of striding pose. So you could say that there's something from that 81 trip to Cairo that then got reflected in that later piece. However, it's not a, I wouldn't, you know, it's not really copying, it's some sort of transformation that occurs between him seeing some things and then incorporating them into um, some sort of ballet. What about ideas from the Akhenaten? Now, the reason I'm suggesting this is he was working a whole year, uh, almost a whole year on that opera with all those meetings to talk about what the opera would be about and how to, you know, what movement there would be. So when he was creating this ballet, his head would have been full of those ideas. So is it possible that uh, in this ballet, he was experimenting with some things he had thought it was thinking about for the Akhenaten opera? So if we look at this first section, we've got these pedestrians using this everyday language of walking and they put this, their arm out, which that was part of the video you saw. And they sometimes stop in profile in this striding pose. And of course, this again makes us think of that figure uh, in the striding pose from Cairo. These uh, pedestrians are then interrupted by these figures that Robin's called angels. And they land with their arms upstretched in the sort of like movement with angel wings. And of course, angels in the Jewish faith are messengers of God. So are these figures some sort of herald in a sense? Are they disruptors of the everyday? Um, and so could this section be uh, a way in movement to express the idea of one of the core themes of the opera, which is this whole thing of divine disruption. And what happens in that first section of the ballet is that you have that everyone's doing that kind of walking. These angels come in and it disrupts all of that walking. And, and then the dancers start moving in a completely different way, similar to the way Egyptians' lives were changed dramatically by the introduction of this new religion. The angels ultimately depart and then people go back to in the ballet to be in the pedestrians again, which is again what happens in Egypt after you know, this, this disruption during the time of, uh, of Akhenaten, people go back to the old religion and the things that he tried to introduce are eradicated and forgotten. Now, the second section, we have this um, stately, slow and intimate duet, very scripted, very formal. And this, this is the couple that strikes that Egyptian pose. 
or they sometimes gesture with the arms like the Egyptian Ka sign. They have this animate uh, temple frieze behind them. And this to me seems potentially to be uh, an exploration of how, how do I depict this royal couple and their relationship and their relationship to the larger picture of Egypt. And as a comparison here, I'm showing you ancient statue of the couple with the ballet couple and then the, the opera couple from the recent production. Now the third section, we've got this very up temple funeral score, you know, it's very ceremonial. And interestingly, the uh, entrances to the section match those of the opera. So the men lead it off uh, just as they do in the opera. And then the women join the ballet just like they join um, in the opera to uh, create this mixed gender chorus. It starts with this uh, lone figure who kind of um, runs around the stage and establishes the space that the whole ceremonial kind of patterns are gonna be held in. Then we've got men done dancing as runners in packs. And then these men with these outstretched flex wrists uh, sometimes in line formations with bent knees. Uh, all of these things, uh, when I had seen this ballet in that particular section, I thought that those things that I just showed you, like with the flex wrist, et cetera, seemed like very specific references that might have some origin. And I saw some things in this book series that I, to me, resembled some of the gestures uh, that we were seeing in, the, in that third section. So if you look at one scene, uh, this is a royal ceremonial scene uh, from that book where we have these uh, male runners running ahead of uh, the royal couple in a, in a chariot. And if we look more closely, there is this herald that's kind of orchestrating the whole scene similar to the way we have that uh, dancer who uh, introduces and orchestrates the whole scene in the third section. And we have these men running uh, in line formations bent over, similar to the way we have these bent over men uh, running in that third section. And if we look at another scene from that book, uh, also another royal ceremony, uh, we have these men gesturing with these flex wrists towards the royal couple. And this of course makes us think of all these uh, men with the flex flexed wrist in, the, in that third section. This section ends with this ecstatic gesture to the heavens. And this you know, is a way of uh, relating perhaps to the frequent gestures to the heavens that we see in a lot of art from the time of Akhenaten. Uh, so is the third section a way of playing with ideas? How do I represent movement in rural ceremonies? Uh, for an opera that's set in ancient Egypt. And the opera has many real ceremonies in it. It has a funeral, a coronation, temple rites, et cetera. Uh, so I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, because he had worked so long in that opera and had a lot of ideas in his head about um, how to depict movement in relationship to the themes of the opera that perhaps some of those things got inserted into glass pieces you know, consciously or, or unconsciously. It was um, something that developed for the ballet. So what is Egypt in glass pieces? It is uh, possibly elements from the Akhenaten opera. It is references to the Egyptian visual arts. It is uh, this pattern and repetitive score that you could relate to things Egyptian. It's people involved who are interested in Egypt. Uh, if the ballet framework that has a relationship to um, Egyptian, the Egyptian canon. And then it's a whole bunch of other things, which you know I've only maybe skimmed the surface of that are not related to Egypt, like the pedestrian choreography of Listen to the Child, or you know, what Fran Leibowitz was contributing, or this whole idea of graph paper and you know, other things that you know, again, we haven't had a chance to discuss. And then we have uh, Robbins orchestrating all of this and creating something that potentially is melding ideas from Egypt with postmodernism, and leaves open the possibility that you could have multiple interpretations of what you're looking at. So that grid we're looking at there, is that subway tile? Is it graph paper? Is it the ancient Egyptian grid? 
is it the postmodernist grid? Is it you know, one or all of the above? We'll conclude with a few recent echoes. And a couple of years ago, uh, the Whitney had this exhibition uh, that talked about the relationship between ballet and the visual arts. And as part of this, there was a dance that interacted with the, the art that was displayed. Uh, interestingly, Fran Leibowitz was involved in this. She was a collaborator. And this dance was uh, inspired by that Egyptian statue of uh, Lincoln Kirstein that we were looking at earlier. Now, when I saw this, something immediately came into my head. I, I don't know whether it's coming into your head or not, but what I immediately thought of was, doesn't this look like how maybe that sketch that he did was one of the inspirations uh, that he then carried forth into, into the Glass Pieces Ballet? And with that, I would like to give thanks to Lorelei, uh, the Institute and the University of Memphis, and then a whole variety of people who helped me uh, research and put this presentation together. That link at the end is, if you want to look at the New York City Ballet video again, it's, it's available at that link. So thank you everyone, and I appreciate your, your time and listening.